there's just not as clear of a sense that this was like this giant international tragedy where I don't know how many people lost their lives and more about yeah. how cool Godzilla beating up the monster. Right, right. And then I guess that's where that tension between, especially in the newest one where it's like, is, is Godzilla this heroic figure that's coming to keep ourselves in check from our own grandiosity or is he something that we genuinely have to fear about ourselves? Like, is he a, a right. reflection of something inside us that we need to um, pay attention to in some way? Or is he this outside force that's coming to reckon with us? Welcome to Cinema of Meaning, the podcast that seeks to explore the depths of what cinema has to offer. My name is Tom, you may know me as the creator of Like Stories of Old, and I'm joined by my fellow video essayist Thomas Flight to welcome you back to our special series titled Cinema of Nuclear Dread, which we are doing in honor of the upcoming release of Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. Last week we talked about Dr. Strangelove and covered subjects like the politics of the atomic bomb and the complicated nature of nuclear deterrence. And today we're venturing into more psychological territories and discuss how the trauma from and fear of nuclear weapons gave birth to the now classic movie monster Godzilla. We're going to be discussing both the original 1954 Japanese movie Gojira as well as the 2014 Hollywood reboot Godzilla. Before we begin, if you enjoy our show and want to help us keep it going, you can support us in two ways. The first is to listen to Cinema of Meaning on Nebula, which lets you enjoy each episode completely ad-free and where you can listen to the next episode in this series a week early. The second way is to join our Discord community on Patreon, where you can discuss movies with us and with fellow listeners. Both Nebula and Patreon will also give you instant access to all of our monthly bonus episodes, which by now has grown into a significant catalogue. For more information, check out the description, you'll find everything you need in there. Thank you for listening to Cinema of Meaning, now on to the show. Thomas, you watched both Godzilla movies, uh, the original Japanese one and the 2014 American reboot, back to back. Um, had you seen them before or was this your first um, first experience of this big movie monster? I had seen the 2014 Godzilla when it came out, and I've seen some of the other newer Godzillas. Um, mm -hmm. But I may have even seen like part of the American version of the classic Godzilla at some point, oh, or maybe yeah. all of it. I don't remember. Um, but this was definitely my first time watching the original 1954 Japanese Godzilla, um, which I which I really enjoyed. Um, and I think it was a really interesting experience to watch the two back to back. I think for anyone who we're going to discuss them here and like, I don't think you have to have seen both of them to appreciate this discussion because, you know, there'll be like spoilers for, for both in this, um, episode, but it, it's not, they're kind of similar stories. So, uh, you know, I don't think the spoilers are that relevant. Um, so I don't think you have to have watched both of them to listen to this episode, but um, if you do watch them both back to back, it really does, I think, kind of like highlight some of the differences. And I don't know, it was just very, it was very interesting to see how Godzilla was kind of being reframed and updated and some of the ways the, mm -hmm. the metaphor was sort of being like, you know, maybe expounded on in some of the ways yeah. things uh, were less clear. I don't know. That's what we'll get into. I think it'll be a really interesting discussion. Um, but yeah, what, what uh, you watched both of them as well? Yeah, I didn't watch them back to back as you did, but um, I'd seen both of them before at, at some point, um, which, but yeah, I, I think they make a really interesting combination because there's not just a gap in culture, but also such a great gap in like time yes uh the first one came out in the 50s the other one just a couple of years ago and they also um i find them also fascinating because both of them are very much 
like these standalone stories whereas uh well at the same time both of them also gave birth to like this giant franchise which um turned godzilla into this more heroic figure or more this iconic figure of culture rather than a very serious um metaphor or like contemplation of nuclear war and the atomic bomb as they were uh, especially in the original Gojira, but uh, I think even if you compare the 2014 Godzilla movie to the ones that came out after that, um, which I think were respectively King of the Monsters, then Godzilla vs. Kong, and yeah. am I missing one, or was it just uh, the two? There might be an... an um, from, from what it looks like, unless I'm missing something, it's yep. just King of Monsters and Oh, yeah. Godzilla versus Kong, yeah. Anyways, these sequels were more like these movie monsters being pitted against each other, and then especially when King Kong came around, which also happened in the Japanese cinematic universe uh, around Godzilla, but it became less about trying to say something meaningful and more about just, hey, here's these two fun characters, let's see them battle it out. Um, and so there's this interesting tension, I think, both in the American as well as in the Japanese interpretation of Godzilla, where you have this thing that started out as a pretty serious, um, a serious, like, cinematic concept, and then it turned into more of a, uh, commercialized, uh, larger project that, right, right. um, became more about entertainment than about conveying, like, this deeper message. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my, my, my first experience with Godzilla was actually the 1999 movie. I want to say, oh yeah, yeah. the, uh, the American one, which was pretty terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even dare to rewatch it now because <laughs> I think it's only going to get even worse. So yeah, we, we've just decided to kind of leave that one out of the equation altogether. Yeah. Um, but I just want to mention that quickly before anyone notices right. well what if there is like some <laughs> right. individual that might be wondering what about the 1991 uh, Godzilla movie <laughs> yeah one thing I, I want to talk about um because I was researching and reading up on this just for my own curiosity and also it it um ended up being really relevant I think to this discussion is there were you know I think we'll talk about this update from how Godzilla looks in 2014 in the American version versus the original Gojira. But it's also interesting to note kind of contextually that the original Japanese version, which wasn't available in the U S I don't know when it became available in the U S but for a long time, it wasn't hmm. until there was a remaster at some point. Um, I think in the two thousands, uh, but so Godzilla comes out in, Japan in 1954 and then two years later in 1996 or 1956 sorry <laughs> two years later in 1956 uh Godzilla King of Monsters came out and th it was this very Americanized version of the Japanese film that kind of uh, removed a bunch of stuff centered the story more around an American character but also basically censored a lot of the the things that uh the the film's original sort of political message and it's the things that created this directly linked godzilla to being like a metaphor for n nuclear uh development mm. bombs and uh testing yeah. and all these things um so i think i think that's very interesting like context that is important to understand like sort of what Godzilla is and sort of the the messiness of it is like there was this very immediate sort of Americanization that was just like trying to turn this movie into something that was not at all what it originally was for American audiences mm -hmm. at a time when, you know, I guess presumably the the assumption there was like oh american audiences aren't going to want to see this meditation on the dis nuclear destruction that you know the they united inflicted. states yeah. inflicted 
um and the 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 response the audience responses to each were reflected that there's reports from then and i'll try to there's some really good articles about this uh that i will put links to in the description um but there's reports from like 1954 of like how moved japanese audiences were at the time the original godzilla came out um because another interesting factor in this whole thing was like when it came out in 1954 uh japan was still under united states occupation following the end of of world war ii and so public discussion of this subject matter wasn't really um possible there was censorship and so the Godzilla movie was one of this first like cultural touchstones where people were able to connect with sort of this like reckoning with this this metaphorical reckoning with yeah. this event that this tragedy that took place um and then it gets scrubbed it comes out in America and American audiences mostly found it to be like a silly goofy campy like monster movie um so i think that duality between those two things kind of really carries forward into sort of mm -hmm. the rest of godzilla's history yeah to what extent do you think that tension was already there in the first movie where um it to me at least it felt a little bit like watching that the original gujira now it felt like there was already a sort of uh, I'm not sure if identity crisis is the right word for it, but a sort of conflicted vision of what the actual Godzilla represents and how the Japanese people relate to it. Um, right. Because right. I felt like there's, there's clearly, you know, the they mentioned the bomb literally, the, or the, the the bomb that dropped on uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. It's it's a that's that event is literally referenced, and there's like this woman on the train that's kind of like casually saying like oh i got i just got out of or i just made it out of nagasaki and now i have to deal with this thing like it's 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 an everyday occurrence for her to be right quote unquote bothered by the nuclear bomb as this minor thing but anyways the, the point was that you know there's this clear link between there's the, the bomb that dropped and then there's the monster that destroys the city so you can kind of put one and one-on-one -on -one together and say like oh maybe Godzilla is just the metaphor for nuclear destruction and for the kind of um, damage and trauma that um, the atomic bombs inflicted but at the same time there's also this scientist character who is more willing to study and to study the monster and who seems more respectful of it and seems even to find or to contemplate like that there's a way the monster can somehow help us to protect ourselves from the nuclear bomb because it's um, in the story or in this story Godzilla came into being because of nuclear testing underwater and so the reasoning that he offers is that oh if if Godzilla survived a, an atomic bomb then maybe we can learn from that and maybe we can use right. him to somehow protect ourselves from radiation and yeah. that sort of stuff so and especially also if you take into consideration how we became how godzilla became more of a heroic figure later on a sort of more like this protector of the earth yeah um i'm just curious where where do you think like that that tension came from between godzilla between being this metaphor for like the dark side of destructiveness and the atomic bomb and more of a sort of not heroic but like more of a uh, protector i guess or maybe some, some some form of avenger almost in uh that, that arises not as the uh, atomic bomb but more as a reckoning for us having meddled with with nuclear energy and nuclear power right right well i think that's one of the interesting trajectories of sort of the evolution of how we're seeing godzilla from the 1954 to uh 2014 is by the time you get to 2014 godzilla wakes up and you have the japanese character in the movie kind of being like godzilla is this force of nature returning balance to things yeah, um, yeah. which like i think 
there's hints of that in the original, but that doesn't that doesn't feel to me like the central um, thematic push of the mm. first film. And the first film ends with you know destroying Godzilla, and there's this main theme of like you you do have this one character who's like maybe we should keep him alive so that we can study him and learn from him. And then there's another character that has a an even bigger weapon, like this weapon that is almost even more destructive that can destroy him, but he and he uses it to destroy Godzilla, but also dis- kills himself in order to like prevent that weapon from ever being used again. So there's this like mm-hmm. tension between like how do we end this thing without um, provoking it further, sort of, um, and I think that stays that feels like it kind of stays consistent to some degree or that feels very relevant to me in terms of like Godzilla as an atomic metaphor where it's like mm-hmm. how how nuclear war or nuclear as this technology developed there was very there's this anxiety of like if we how are how are things going to escalate and yeah yeah you know, the only proper way to respond to Godzilla, to this thing, is to, like, not try it. You can't really fight it. Like, if you try to fight it, it angers him and it gets worse. Um, and, like, I don't, there's something interesting in that where it's, like, you can't, you don't want to provoke this thing further or you don't want to try to create something that could destroy it because that would be... That would just make mm-hmm. the problem worse in 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 to some extent. Um yeah. which I think is interesting. Um but like I I personally I have to be honest, have trouble like sorting out what exactly how exactly as a metaphor he work like he works. Mm-hmm which is what you're saying where it's like, yeah, yeah. you know, is especially once we get into that territory of like, he might be a natural force that's returning balance. It's like, well, if he's a, if he's a metaphor in some sense for like nuclear destruction and we're thinking about nuclear destruction as this like natural force returning balance to things. Um, I don't know. It feels like that's very weird territory for me to like wrap my head around, but maybe there, there's a cultural yeah. divide there too, where, you know, my Western perspective and also being detached, like on the opposite end of these events is like, you know, preventing me from seeing it in a way that would be more illuminating. Yeah. Uh, I think that's one possibility. Or I think the other possibility is that metaphors are imperfect and, you know, making yeah. a monster movie about nuclear war is just never good, like never going to be perfect. I don't know. Yeah. What do you, what do you think about that? That. Yeah. I, I had the same conflicted feelings. That's why I was going to put this question on you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wouldn't have to answer it myself. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I, the watching the original Gojira now, especially after having seen the trailer for Oppenheimer also, um, yeah. at the time of recording, we have not yet seen Oppenheimer, unfortunately. Uh, but there's this line in one of the trailers where I think it's Oppenheimer who says something along the lines of, oh, it's going to be the biggest bomb that the world has ever seen or whatever. And then there's this other guy uh, played by one of the Sadfi brothers, I think, um, who's like, oh, until someone builds a bigger one. Right. Uh, and I think the character who says that is one of the Russian uh, scientists uh, who goes on to create... I think one of the, uh, the the actually biggest nuclear bomb, the Tsar Bomba, um, years later. But that's that sort of progression that to me was already reflected in that final sequence in Gojira, where you have this strange scientist who has built this, the oxygen destroyer. I think it was called this, the bomb that's bigger than the nuclear bomb. And I think that's there's some like something weirdly prescient about that in the sense that you know the Gojira obviously came out of the trauma from Nagasaki and right. Hiroshima but in looking back on the trajectory of nuclear development since you know those bombs are like 
tiny compared to the bombs that came later and the, to the destructive capabilities that we have now. They're, they're so much worse than yeah. what was possible back then. And so I feel like that's, to some extent, that's reflected there in that, you know, the bomb that's bigger than the original bomb and more destructive that uh, it could even wipe out the the Godzilla monster, which is the 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 sort of metaphor here for the right for the for that original bomb. Yeah, the the last thing I was gonna say is that there's um, the element there that might be relevant is that it doesn't just destroy Godzilla, but it also pretty much ruins like the whole ocean. At least yes, that's yes. to me it's what it's felt like. That so it felt like there's. Uh, this monster that we have to contend with, but if we really, um, I, I guess there's a, like a fatalistic reading that, you know, once the genie is out of the box, it cannot go back in. And so the only way this will end, if we, if we you know, if we want to erase this nuclear awareness or the, 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 the knowledge of nuclear power from our collective um, being or like from our society, if we want to erase it, that would also mean the erasing of like everything around it and it would be um like just total destruction and so in that sense there's a reading of that argues for this more pessimistic vision that okay it's it's out now it's gonna get worse and it's only gonna end with like total e even greater destruction uh, i don't want to say total necessarily but um it, it's it's going to lead to as you mentioned to further escalation until at some point um who you know god knows where we'll end up with it but um yeah i'm not sure if that's the correct reading but um that's yeah. w like my weird interpretation of it watching it now knowing like a, a little bit of what oppenheimer is going to be about and sort of projecting that back on yeah what what kojira may have been doing way back in the, in the 50s i mean i i think there was also a pretty explicit like political message uh, mm -hmm. in the film that I think goes along with kind of that that pessimism that you're describing. Um, but one, I think, important piece of kind of historical context that uh, is important as well is um, after, during the time the original Gojira, Gojira film was released, there, the U.S. was still doing uh, testing near Japan. Um, there was a situation where they dropped a bomb, I forget which one, but it was larger the impact radius was larger than uh, what the U.S. had calculated for. There was a bunch of fishing mm -hmm. boats that ended up being in that radius. And then, like, contaminated fish got, like, before anything could be done about it because the U.S. was denying it happened. Contaminated fish got back into Japan and a bunch of people got sick because of this fish. So that stuff was still happening, like, as the movie was coming out. Um and so I think there's this contending, not just with the bombs that were dropped on on Japan, but this kind of continuing sort of like disregard by the United States for the well-being of the people in Japan as they continue to pursue bigger, even bigger nuclear weapons. And so it's it's in that context that this movie comes out. And I think there's a there's a line like towards the end where it's like, more Godzilla, another Godzilla will be created. Like we destroyed this one, but there will be another Godzilla if we continue doing nuclear testing. Yep. Um, so I think you're you're right that it is very pessimistic because it's also coming with kind of this like call for like, hey, stop! <laughs> like we need to stop doing yeah. this. Um, which is the tragedy of that kind of being like that. That message obviously was very literally censored you know, that line gets cut out of the version that ends up in America. And then, you know, nuclear, the, the nuclear testing and it never escalated into more warfare, but like, you know, the yeah. cold war and everything and the, the world that we're still in now, which we, you know, we've been discussing is like this kind of more recent resurgence of like actual concern about what could happen with these weapons still, uh, mm -hmm you know, is like all of that comes well in the wake of, of this movie. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think it is, it is this pessimistic warning and one that was never really heated. And so therefore it's still kind of this like yeah. cautionary 
uh, kind of kind of tale. Um, yeah. So maybe that's a good entry point into 2014 Godzilla. Yeah. Did Did you see that one when it came out, or did you? Yeah, I uh, I, uh, uh, I saw it in theaters. Oh yeah. Um, well, what was your first impression back then? I liked it at the time. I mean, I didn't mm -hmm. know much of like I didn't know much about Godzilla, so I didn't have like you know a, a nostalgic relationship with it or or anything like that. Um, yeah. I thought it was, uh, you know, I thought some of the beginning and midpoint, I think, were kind of slow and lagged a little bit. Um, mm. I still think that now, and I remember thinking that then. Um, but I really appreciated the way that um, Gareth Edwards kind of anchored the monsters and a lot of the action within, like, a the perspective of individuals or like the ground level, um, that yeah, yeah. scene where they drop out of the plane is, is I think incredible. Uh, I thought that then I think still now is like, does a really good job of like framing the whole thing in a way that's just terrifying. So yeah, I enjoyed all that. I think, I think aspects of it, I really liked about how he shot it. Um, you know, this was a time where like seeing something smashing up a city was like a really common uh yeah like cinematic experience <laughs> and it's so become it, even more common since yeah yeah exactly so i think at the time i remember feeling like this was kind of a fresh take on that where it felt more like grounded in like the perspective of people like on the ground um mm -hmm. but i don't i don't remember at the time thinking like uh this is a profound metaphor for uh you know nuclear war um yeah although i do I do, I did then, and I still do now, I appreciate the sort of like the central theme of most of the human effort to, uh, to like stop the situation is kind of like ends up being like not very productive and fairly inconsequential, um, which I think brings to the foreground this, this like, uh, this feeling of like humans are meddling with things that are like bigger than, than, uh, what they really can control, uh, which I think is true. Like, I think that's true mm -hmm. in the, with the case of nuclear weapons. Um, there is a sense in which it is something monstrous that like, we don't really like we're meddling with something like that's a bigger monster than what we can really control. Um, yeah, but I don't know how that lines up with like Godzilla kind of being a hero. <laughs> that's where it gets yeah, weird for I, me. I think that's one of the most notable differences between. Also, I want to mention that I I, I think that in, in in with regards to um, the movie commenting on like man's arrogance and controlling nature, there's are like obvious callbacks there to Jurassic Park, which you also have like visually yes. with like the hel helicopter coming over the tropical forest and um the, the the other monster coming out of the cage by like slowly chipping away at these electrical wires which uh sort of mimics the uh uh tyrannosaurus escape in the original jurassic park um but that was also the point that was gonna the other point i was gonna make is that this movie immediately introduces a different monster the Mut muto i think it was called yeah massive unidentified terrestrial terrestrial organism or something <laughs> yeah something <laughs> muto easier um to me at least when you have like two creatures two separate creatures it's e or it, it's very difficult to avoid moralizing the conflict in some way or at least yes. it, it, to to have those be neutral like truly neutral and uh because that's what you also see later on when uh, Godzilla starts fighting King Kong or some other monster, or you even see it with like the superheroes, Batman v Superman. Uh, there's always like when there's like two, 
one when there's like two characters involved either you have one be the hero and, and one be the villain or you have two heroic characters but then they often introduce like this third hero which which i guess is what i was saying with the uh, yeah yeah which comes later with kong versus uh, godzilla um but here in this one there's more of a that 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 more classical divide where you have two characters who battle it out and you know you can't help but sympathize with one over the other in this case that's clearly Godzilla which is supposed to be the victor or uh, over these uh, more uh, dangerous or at least perceived to be more dangerous creatures the Mutos um, I'm not sure why exactly I think it's because those are uh, there's two of them a, a, a male and a female and they're uh, mating so I'm guessing <laughs> there's a fear of them making more Mudos and yeah yeah uh, which is more dangerous than one giant Godzilla, which doesn't seem to want to do anything particularly destructive to humanity. It's just that, you know, humanity and our society just gets in the way of what he wants to do, which is to hunt the Mutos. But that, to me at least, that that's what creates already this very different dynamic in which you can't help but look at the Godzilla monster as some kind of... Um, heroic figure or at least a, a non-neutral figure who has yeah, yeah. um an enemy that we also that's also our enemy which would then turn godzilla into this sort of reluctant ally yeah. um quite literally as later on they um uh sort of guide him towards the mutos and then especially in the second movie where they deliberately uh sort of revive godzilla in order to help uh ourselves fight the even bigger more evil monster yeah but yeah in that sense the movie as a more metaphorical vehicle for nuclear war or the the, the atomic bomb becomes a little bit more um messy yeah i'd yeah. say i think that this movie even though it does explicitly show that godzilla was first awakened because of nuclear testing or um I, i'm forgetting if he was i don't think he was created because of the nuclear bomb because it's argued that he was already like sort of dormant right like right. way below the the surface or in the inner, inner earth or something like that yeah there's this sense that there is nuclear power involved or like um there is like an homage paid to the or the origins of Godzilla, but at the same time, I think they wanted to move away to what at the time was the more relevant metaphor, which I think is more almost comes closer to like climate change and yes, us yeah. meddling with like the foundations of the world and then uh, which awakens these mutos and which then awakens Godzilla as this sort of force that's going to reckon everything into balance again, which if we're not careful, also means that humanity is also going to be, in part at least, um, brought into ruins. Right. Um, because I'm, I'm forgetting, if, I'm not sure if you remember how exactly the Mutos came. I know those are the ones that feed on radiation, uh, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I think, I mean, it has something to do with the collapse, like, or no, no, because it was their them awakening that collapses the the uh, nuclear power plant at the beginning. Mm. Um, so yeah, I don't remember the exact. Yeah, I don't. I'm guessing they're awakened then by the activities in the nuclear plant, which um, because that's kind of where the movie starts. You have Brian right. Cranston's um, scientist guy character um, who experiences this tragedy where. The plant, the nuclear plant that he works at, is destroyed by the first emerging Muto, uh, which uh, during this accident his wife is also killed and he's only left with his son, um, which sets up this more personal relation or like these personal character arcs. Uh, as we then jump to like a couple of a couple of years later, the son is now grown into uh, an adult who is called Fort Brody. Ford, I guess it is. Yeah. He's like this bomb disposal guy in the army, and he has developed like this strenuous relation with his dad, who has become, ever since the accident, become this kind of conspiracy nut job who turns out to be right, of course. Right. But, um, <laughs> you know, it 
he's he's been obsessed with whatever happened at the plant and um he he you know that that's obviously caused some friction with his relation with his son um until then the second muto appears i think or at least is called by the other one uh which then awakens from this nuclear waste storage facility and then which triggers the rise of um godzilla which that's the whole plot into motion and which then uh, also gives like or starts like the character journeys from ford and uh, his dad and their sort of reconciliation um which i actually really enjoyed like uh, unlike you i think the first half is probably my favorite like i like the slower setup and the sort of establishing of like uh somewhat interesting characters uh especially compared to the later movies um and i think it's especially after like 40 minutes or so after um brian cranston's character is killed off that i feel like the movie is kind of struggling to find its direction um especially because brian cranston was a far more interesting character i think than the son was uh, yeah yeah who was played by uh Aaron Taylor Johnson, great actor, not his fault. It's just like his his character was just kind of this blank face, <laughs> yeah, it's not military great. dude who yeah. has a wife and a and a kid and no personality <laughs> beyond yeah. that. Really, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I think I agree with you though. That's more or less what I mean. Like uh, around the time where it like feels like he goes out and is traveling with the bomb towards San Francisco. Yeah, it's like. It feels like the movie just like took a step back or something like there's something weird about the way it's paced through the middle that like yeah, doesn't yeah. quite um so i don't mind the character set up at the beginning uh that that much i think it's just like it feels like it takes a long time to get to like godzilla yeah, yeah. showing up or like it makes one too many it, i think it, or it takes it both takes a long time and then once he shows up there's the big like money shot but then it immediately cuts away so you're like there's not there's like a bit too little like satisfaction for that right. much of a build-up yeah, um, yeah although i do appreciate the uh as you said like that it remains focused on what characters experience and so instead of having this more omniscient overview of the, the the first battle between uh godzilla and the mudo you can you kind of see it through a television as like a lot of the characters in the world in this world would be doing like they're seeing it on television on the news and yeah um, that's how we're experiencing it too for the most part um but yeah I, 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 as i watched this movie i was trying to think of if there was a way um that Brian Cranston's character could have been more centralized throughout the whole story because I do understand why he had to be killed off, narratively speaking, because it was sort of this thing where then his son would take over and kind of retroactively learn what his father learned and then find out for himself and in that way sort of repair his or repair their relationship. Uh, while at the same time also giving the son something to do because he has his own special skill that gets useful towards the end. Um, and I think the issue, if you if you don't kill off Brian Cranston, then the son character would have been kind of redundant maybe yeah, yeah. or wouldn't have enough to do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm still, I'm still not sure. I, I think if they had given the story like a couple more passes, that would have been a way to maybe have both of them in there and have the sort of reconciliation and then the team up between father and son become more of an interesting dynamic towards the end um instead of the one that we get now where it's mostly about ford and uh his wife who's also trapped in the city but she doesn't really um have a whole lot to do as far as i can remember yeah so yeah at the end it becomes kind of I've seen the movie a couple of times, but for some reason, I always keep forgetting, like, I have so many blank spots still in what happens to the right, second right, half yeah. of it. Yeah. No, I was rewatching it, and granted, it had been almost a decade since, I, since mm -hmm. I had seen it in theaters, but I was like, I don't remember. I remember, like, shots and mm -hmm. set pieces and, like, certain ways that Godzilla was, like, portrayed in the movie, but I had zero recollection of any of the plot uh, because... 
there's not I, I think there's not quite enough there to uh grab onto and yeah. um at least by the end like it starts to set the groundwork at the beginning but then none of that quite pays off in the way that is satisfying and so the way it really shines and then i think what's stuck in my memory was like you know dropping through fog and seeing god like a glimpse of godzilla yeah. through your you know yeah that uh, part was really goggles cool. or whatever as was um, the atomic breath at the end yes yeah um, the witcher was also <laughs> there in the original gujira but it that yeah. didn't look as um uh, yeah, it didn't it end with Godzilla as it did in the, yeah, ripping a monster head the off. Ripping apart. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a that's a that's a cool uh cool little bit. Yeah, which I think is an interesting. It's definitely something of note. I think is like, it's not just about how to me the 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 difference between these movies isn't just about how the metaphor shifts or changes or gets messier necessarily. It's also like mm-hmm. a different kind of, it's a, it's a different thing. It's a different kind of movie. Um, like if you watch Gojira, it's not terrifying now because I think to our sensibility, you know, a black and white film with, uh, you know, practical effects that yeah. feel are still cool, but like feel out of date at this point. It feels, it, yeah, it can feel it, a little bit goofy. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to be like fully immersed in that, but it it seems pretty clear to me watching it that the intention was not like the intention was to create something that was invoking a very real sense of like uh, a, a sense of a disaster that was or or a, like something actually horrifying was the like what they were trying to invoke um mm-hmm. through the monster and through how they you know, it didn't feel like action to me. It felt like we have this monster and he's destroying things and um, and that destruction is supposed to sort of actually feel horrifying. Um, that's how it seems to me. I, you know, I don't know what Japanese people were thinking in 1954, but uh, mm-hmm. that's what it feels like looking back. And then you watch, I think, you know, Godzilla kind of went on this trajectory after that. And then by the time you get to, 2014 you have regrounding it in the nuclear metaphor a little bit but it's still like this is an action movie you know this is a movie that's going to end with like godzilla ripping apart another monster and like Mm -hmm. fighting you know and there's there is a little bit of horror there but almost like the most horrifying thing in the whole movie is the opening when like brian cranston has to watch the like you know gates close on his his wife you know and knowing that she's going to die uh godzilla 2014 is is like an action adventure movie with some kind of horrifying elements and and some light nuclear metaphor whereas uh the original godzilla was like more strictly sort of like this i mean had these sci-fi elements obviously but uh i don't know it feels very different to me yeah i feel like the destruction in gojira was less of a spectacle and still retained like some genuine terror or at least some yes. kind of destruction that felt imaginable with like uh, you know there's the, some shots of the the ruins of uh the destroyed city and it genuinely feels like this completely war-torn or, or better yet like a completely uh atomic bomb ravaged right. place like this nothing standing like metals have melted and um it, it it does feel like you 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 get a be- much better sense of how the nuclear bomb was like this whole different uh, beast of destruction compared to like regular or uh, yeah. traditional warfare, and I feel like that's also something that the newer movie kind of loses when it becomes about you know the whole uh, you have the Ken Watanabe character who's like oh let them fight right. Um, and where it becomes more of this monster mash where the city just becomes like this playground where um, each building that's destroyed is more like part of the spectacle rather than like a genuine tragedy even though there's you know I guess that's where the the, the wife character comes in of uh, Ford that she does give us some perspective as to right. how all that destruction is actually experienced on the ground by 
the actual people, but still, I th I can't help but feel like there's just a bit too much destruction. Like there's this also this point where one of the Mutos, I think it is, just blasts through like Las Vegas. Right. Yeah. But it's yeah. there's almost like uh, I, I wouldn't say comic relief, but it's it, it, it's kind of played. A little bit too casually in my opinion and then at the end of course you know when there's he, as you said like he's smashing the mudo into some building and then yeah. another one and it, it, at, at some point it just becomes like visual noise instead of like a true uh sense of destruction and dread and yeah um yeah that, that's just not as clear of a sense that this was like this giant international tragedy where I don't know how many people lost their lives and more about a yeah. uh, cool Godzilla beating up the monster <laughs> right, right. and then which is yeah. then kind of affirmed at the end where he seems to be dead but then he wakes up and he sort of walks off into the ocean and it, it, there's this weird feeling where it's like oh everything is well I guess but then you also kind of look around and then the whole city is ruined yeah, yeah. it's completely in ruins so yeah I, I, I guess that where I guess that's where that tension between Especially in the newest one, where it's like is is Godzilla this heroic figure that's coming to keep ourselves in check from our own grandiosity, or is he something that we genuinely have to fear about ourselves? Like, is he a, a right. reflection of something inside us that we need to um, pay attention to in some way, or is he this outside force that's coming? to reckon with us if we kind of like cross some kind of boundary or some uh, yeah. if we transgress too much uh, within what should be our natural limits as a species maybe yeah um and i think the mo this movie falls into the latter category where it seems like that's more the case more like that jurassic parky um or jurassic park-esque um reflection of like if we meddle too much with nature like nature will come back to bite us in the ass and yeah um yeah it feels like that's more what the 2014 movie seems to lean on which yeah i guess is a fair metaphor um i think it mostly works but uh yeah as a um as a direct link to um the nuclear um right metaphor it. It becomes a little. Uh, if you think, uh, if you think about it too hard, it gets really hmm. weird. It makes me very uncomfortable because, like, I so I'll say I think you're right, and I think it it does kind of work. And I re I like that's the vibe I got from the first time I watched it, not having seen the original 1954 uh, Godzilla, was like, you know, oh, I knew he's related to nuclear stuff somehow, but mostly it's about hey, don't. Don't meddle with things you can't control. Don't meddle with forces of nature beyond your control or like it's going to come back to bite you. But then like when you think about some of when you think about that shift in the metaphor in the context of like the original Godzilla is kind of about it's this thing that comes out of the ocean and just wreaks havoc on Japan and then they are desperately trying everything to like stop it and they eventually figure out how to and then for the time being and then they're like nuclear testing you know pursuing these things is bad it's going to create more of this and then you jump ahead and it's kind of like godzilla is kind of on our side a little bit like maybe you know it's like yeah. uh, he's dangerous and we can't meddle with him but like kind of like it's kind of working out in our favor is like a little bit of the vibe of how it's going in the 2014 movie, which like yeah. just feels really weird to me from the perspective of, you know, this is a an American movie me being made by the people who are in the country who are like, yeah, we're, we're developing all these bombs and we're the only ones who are dropping them anywhere, but like, we're fine. It's not really destroying us that mm -hmm. much i don't know it's like i don't think that's what anybody making this movie is explicitly trying to say with this but it just feels there's something like that there's something about it about that evolution of the character that makes me feel weird 
um, mm-hmm. when it, when you try to relate it back to that like that original um, that original thing. But is is this where we get into the controversial territory of questioning whether the United States was justified in dropping the bomb? Right. Well, I, guess, I feel like yeah, I feel like yeah, that, that's, that's still pretty much a like prevailing sentiment, right? That it was not necessarily justified, but at least necessary, like, or to, it it wasn't like a smaller evil to prevent like an even greater evil. Right. Right. Um, And I think that's where the discussion I think is really going to get interesting as we get into Oppenheimer, which I think is going to have to kind of face some of that thematically. So maybe we can get more into that then, but if I was mm-hmm. putting my cards on the table, I would have to say, like, I have issues with, like, morally justifying the use of the bombs, even, like, on a, like, oh, it was necessary, or, like, mm-hmm. um, you know, I don't know the the all the details of the history and everything that went mm-hmm. into that, like, um, decision, but... Yeah. I just know, like, my personal, like, moral sense of the situation. It's just, like, it does, it it doesn't feel like that kind of, um... It's crossed, a, like, a boundary. Yeah, it feels or, like yeah, a line yeah. is crossed. But yeah, I'm also, yeah. like, I don't know if I would say I'm a pacifist, but, like, I'm pr- I lean pretty heavily in that direction towards, like, you know, I think mm-hmm. if, like, somebody's like directly attacking you like self-defense i don't have a problem with but like outside Mm. of that like pretty much any kind of violence makes me i tend to have a problem with so like that's just my you know it's like those are that's the perspective i'm coming from thinking about these Mm -hmm. things um so you know i don't know i I, for the record i don't think the 2014 godzilla is trying to or at least unintentionally is arguing for that perspective where the bomb was necessary i don't think because it, i yes. think it does clearly establish that the godzilla is like an outsider figure like right. it's, it's something non-human like outside of like even uh human concepts of justice that's coming to reckon with us yeah yeah um instead of like being this necessary evil that the united states awakens specifically to uh Com- combat what they perceive as this other threat which are these these mutos yeah, yeah um so i don't think that's the case um and i agree i don't i don't think that's explicitly trying to be stated with this film it it, it is just interesting when you when you're trying to transpose this very like symbolic figure to something else it's like it's already a monster movie, <laughs> like as mm-hmm. symbolism for like these really heavy issues. Um, so it's messy in the first place. And then you're like, we Americans literally, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it, this is where it's fascinating to me that like movies are this stage on which this kind of like cultural, like dialogue can play out where it's like, literally you have the United States who dropped these bombs on Japan. Japan makes this movie and then the United people in the U.S. can just buy the rights to that and then just be like, yeah, yeah. oh, we're going to start making movies about this and, like, change the meaning or, like, say what we want to say about it. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm not passing judgment on that or saying, like, this movie shouldn't be made. I'm just saying, like, I find it fascinating to look at, at, the, at what that says about the cultures and the way like we perceive ourselves the way we see metaphors differently the way like we think about these stories or how they evolve over time um all of all of this is a really like incredible um essentially like artifact of cultural history and and how we relate to to stories about like things that have happened in real life um and and how we relate to them differently in different cultures. I agree. Yeah. I think it's definitely natural and okay for metaphors to change over time and to be adapted and readapted into different cultures or different uh, time periods. Um, yeah. 
The, the one thing I'll add to that with regards to the 2014 uh, Godzilla is that I do feel like there's some sense of guilt there in the... You know, there's a, a couple of movies in the last 20 years or so that have kind of had this undercurrent of... Um, I'm not sure what the right word is, like masochism maybe, or the almost like a sort of anti-humanity sentiment where it feels like there's this undercurrent where a movie is suggesting that, oh, you know, humans are the actual parasites on the planet and we're right. destroying our home. And I feel like that's more and more becoming like a feeling that a lot of people have about ourselves or about our society especially here in the west i think um which is also being expressed i think in some ways through movies like 2014's godzilla um where there's almost like this feeling like godzilla is coming to destroy us but we deserve it so that's what makes him also a heroic figure like we yeah yeah it's almost like we deserve like some kind of reckoning so we're almost like it's not that we're cheering for godzilla because we side him alongside ourselves but it's that that we kind of project ourselves like as the villains and so we're cheering for godzilla against our own uh species almost yeah yeah um it's like the orcas uh yeah we see that literally sometimes with uh those orcas that were attacking the boats there was a lot of people online who were like well you know good they're fighting back like it's Mm -hmm. you know there's a sense of like we intruded upon them and so like you know it's what we deserve essentially in response to that and i I guess that i I find that dynamic really interesting because you know there's some part of me that wants to cast that aside you know to do not be that kind of kind of pessimist about who we are because i think it's mostly uh useless when it comes to like actually making an effort to then do away with that bad right. part of ourselves or or, or 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 of our society um but at the same time i also feel like especially when you put it next to the fear of escalation with nuclear weapons and the sense that we've opened this Pandora's box and now we cannot close it, that we feel like we're trapped in this cycle where we have no control over what we've created. Um, And so we kind of feel like that's the only way to stop ourselves is to have some other outside thing come in and uh, basically save us from ourselves. Um, Right, right. Which I think this is actually also moving ahead to like Oppenheimer like if you go back to Nolan's Tenet there's also this interesting sense where you know you have this time inversion mechanic yeah uh, which is coming to us from the future but then the goal in the present is to stop it from uh, ever being invented and so there's this sense that I talked about this in the uh, the Christopher Nolan retrospective that I made is that there's this goal to sort of uninvent the atomic bomb to ha- to erase that knowledge for before it even becomes a thing right. and there's like uh, a line early in the movie where one character is explaining the 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 conflict to the protagonist and then he says like you know to to know its true nature to know like the true nature of the conflict is already to lose which means that you know once the bomb has been invented like once the knowledge is is out there that's already like that's the the failure state that's already when um things are have been lost and that's i wonder how that's going to play out in oppenheimer especially when there's that sense of having created something and then knowing that it will never be uncreated again or at least not without you know right. significant d- destructive consequences that would yeah. uh, erase us or set us back into the stone age or whatever and so in that sense, I think Tenet might actually be an interesting segue also to into Oppenheimer as we're, um, if you want like a movie to rewatch before yeah. to prepare yourself for um, Oppenheimer. But yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I'm just fascinated by that idea of 
once knowledge is out there, there's no way to kind of pull it back and um, how that kind of affects us psychologically also, where we feel that that is happening, but we also become constricted by that knowledge and then, um, or by, by the awareness of knowledge. And um, yeah, that, that, that to me, that's where there's like an interesting bleakness almost in as to how we can then um, move forward in a way to still um, contain it in some way or to have it not be destructive or to break the cycle in to some yeah. extent. Um, so yeah, I, I just find that very interesting and I'm very curious to see how that's going to play out in Oppenheimer. Yeah, I agree. If people want to listen to that discussion, it's available right now on Nebula for the public listeners. If you're listening to this episode in our public feed, then the Oppenheimer episode is out now on the Nebula feed and you can get access to that and listen to the finale of this discussion by uh, going to nebula.tv slash cinema of meaning. You can sign up, you'll get access to Nebula which has all of our bonus episodes, a bunch of other exclusive content from a bunch of other great YouTubers and content from us. And you'll get access to this podcast a week early, which means you can listen to the Oppenheimer episode right now. So check that out and support the show.